What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 165 of Category 5 Technology TV. You'll find us online, www.category5.tv. Exactly. As shown in the footer that contains the real date. The real date. It is Tuesday, November the 16th, 2010. In case this information seems dated, you're watching it after the fact, and you realize it's a year old. But for tonight, we are live. Wow. So we'd love to get your questions uh, in the chat room, category5.tv, on Freenode in the Category 5 chat room. And, of course, uh, you can also just... Uh, throw us an email live at category5.tv send us some emails yeah, yeah. how you doing i'm doing all right yeah you? i have not seen you in doing a week. good i know literally we haven't seen you you were since supposed to come out and see hockey sunday how did it go you we lost actually we have Moment a perfect record this season my uh, my sunday morning team yeah perfect record fantastic yeah. a perfect record of no wins no wins that would be my perfect record. No ties. <laughs> no, there's record. consistency for you. Consistency. Yes, that is you know, consistency. Like, but we are, oh, we're SpongeBob SquarePants. We are eternally optimistic, so it's, it's okay. And perfect. <laughs> Welcome to everybody who's joining us. Uh, good to see you, John. Uh, nice to have you here. Oh, there he is. Oh, there hey. he is. Hey. Hi, everybody. Just gets better looking each day. We've got oh, Hillary, yeah. uh, who's Hi. also joining. I know, it's like ever since we put a camera on this guy, he starts dressing up. It's fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll be wearing a tie next week. A tie. I was going to say, he has a collar this week. Show next us, week, a tie. Show us up, you know? Yeah. Hillary, how are you? I am fabulous, and I come to you from a bed and breakfast. I am here because my internet in my dorm room is dead. Turns out when all your roommates are watching their online TV shows, it sucks all your bandwidth up for the month. So I relocated to this bed <laughs> and breakfast, and I will be doing the news from here. Hillary, I guess at first it seemed like a good idea to tell all your roomies that, hey, by the way, I'm live tonight. Check out this website and you'll be able to tune in. And then all of a sudden this happens. And so it looks like you're, you're on like a kind of a slow connection again tonight. And, and we're going to get some probably some artifacts. It's like weird the Saturday Night Live thing where they do the remote thing and... Yeah, we're just going to have to wing it. I don't know. We'll see. It'll be a mystery. It's like, where will I end up next week? You just don't know because... Well, I go where the internet is. Fantastic. And we'll just see. Uh, so for those of you who are watching tonight and when Hillary is on, you may notice our artifacts. You may notice um, choppiness. And sometimes people start going crazy in the chat room saying, oh, the video's lagging, the vi video's choppy and stuff. And it's not really the video. It's the connection to uh, through Skype video uh, to Hillary herself because of the connection that she's on. Uh, with the internet connection. So we're, we're very happy to have you here. I know that it's been a little bit stressful to get you uh, here tonight, Hillary, and I appreciate you taking the time and, and finding a spot that you can get online and, uh, and be able to, uh, to chat with us. There you go. So what do you have coming up in the news for tonight? Oh, people, I don't know if you can handle this. Coming up in the newsroom, Fedora Linux may eventually drop the X window system in favor of Wayland. Facebook has unveiled their new modern messaging service, and no, it's not quite email, but it does include a Facebook.com email address. And you can block Service One Pack from installing on your Windows 7 computer with a helpful tool from Microsoft. Surprise, surprise, Linux continues to be substantially faster than Windows in the supercomputer market. And now you can parallel park like a pro with the 2011 BMW 55i. Stick around for the latest news from the Category 5 TV newsroom. That's fantastic because I just happen to have a BMW sitting in the back. Yeah. Just yeah. happened to. <laughs> I think that's, uh, that was part of my signing bonus when I came on to Cat 5. That was that was in the contract, yeah. was it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you didn't read the fine print I forgot all. to sign it, actually. <laughs> Did you want to? <laughs> actually, I see Gadget Wisdom Guru has just pointed out that maybe now that John's a married man, his wife has been helping him get dressed before the show. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> Could be, could be. He knows could that be. he knows that she's watching. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Christy. <laughs> hey, Christy. Could be. Yeah, could Other be. The fact is, she's not in town. Mm. No, she was working hard. Christy, uh, our former uh, yeah co-host here. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, she's working hard. She's got it going on. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. So we got uh, lots of questions uh, coming in in the chat room. We got some emails there. there. Do get your questions in. I know Eric is is looking at the at email and stuff, and we didn't get a whole lot of email this week. Yeah, um, what's up with that? I don't know. Come on, people. Oh. We've been Here. answering your questions. That's what we're here for. Uh, but we do have some viewer testimonials, and uh, we love to receive those viewer testimonials and be able to say, hey, uh, as people submit those. So I'll just bring those up on our website, category5.tv. It's a way for you to let us know what you think of the show. What are they going on about now? I was just showing them. It's coffee. It's coffee. It is coffee. You make everything sound like it's a party, though, Eric. So what are they supposed to Well, think? you know, somebody was wondering if I was into the Bushmills. Last week, I sent the guy out to pick up some poppies from the convenience store. So that we had poppies. Those those flowers that we were wearing are, are in remembrance of our fallen soldiers and those who are uh, who are fighting for our freedom right now. And that was the mission, the quest that yes. I had you on. And yet you made it sound like I sent you to LCBO. It, <laughs> no, no, no. I don't even think it was Reckon. It may have been Gadwell, but somebody mentioned Bushmills, and or Jameson perhaps. And I said Bushmills, but no, it was uh, it was a poppy mission. It and, was. Uh, it was. And. Uh, yeah, it was more of a challenge than it I certainly imagined. Was. Popular. <laughs> I just gone to the family. Legion. I, yeah, <laughs> there's, a got, there's a question. Oh well, I've got, I've got viewer testimonials. I'm just going to hit here. I've got Chris is uh, joining us from Aussie out of Oregon, and gives us five out of five sons and says, "Eric, blooming great show, fellas. I found you both on uh, at episode number 162 via Miro Internet TV." Now back watching all those episodes that precede 162. I am also a new user to Ubuntu 10.04 and must say it is a very nice OS indeed. I started out in the days of 086s and IBM DOS on five and a half inch or five inch discs. Remember those old bad boys? Yeah. Don't fold them in half, you'll never get your data off. Half, they were five and a quarter. Five and a quarter, yeah. three and a half. Yeah. That's right. Actually, when I, uh, now he's going to go back a little well, further, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. When I was your age. Oh, no, when I, when I first got to the TV station, there was a couple that, I mean, the discs were They were, were, they were like LPs. This. Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. Fantastic. And they could hold an entire kilobit. Kilobyte. Yeah. Not yeah, even. Bite. 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 Uh, goes on to say, Chris here uh, says, PC back then was a Commodore Colt and twin floppy drives. Cheers from Chris. Back in the days before they had hard drives, you had to have the two floppy yes. drives. One to read, one to write. Fantastic. Right. Take it well, back. One was for the OS, and one was, didn't you need another one for any of the programs? Like, say Pretty you want Word Perfect, you had to have Whatever another one. Yeah. If you're, if you're using BASIC to program some stuff, <laughs> you boot from the one disk, and that's your BASIC app, and then you've got your other disk as your, what you're actually saving. Uh, Chris finishes by saying, P.S. I'll be looking out for your, you, Solar Man, a.k.a. Robbie, in Planet Calypso. See you, mate. Chris, uh, I'll look forward to seeing you in Planet Calypso. I guess I'm now known as Solar Man because of the... Uh, <laughs> the uh, just because they white balance the cameras off of my head, as some people have mentioned in the chat room, uh, doesn't mean that, uh, that I am Solar Man. Angel D. Rodriguez from California says, Thanks for your help last week. You instructed on uh, your instructions on installing Apache 2 server in Ubuntu to see files and folders via a web browser helped me out a lot. I was stuck for a little while until I figured out that I needed to change the slash var slash www reference in two places, not just in the document root reference, but also on the directory reference. Your help got me far enough to figure it out. I then added a link to the file server on our tech support page so our techs can have access to the files that they need across campus. Thanks again, Robbie, and a big smiley face. Angel, I'm so pleased that uh, that, that was able to help you, and I love uh, what Angel says there is that we, we gave you just enough information to get you started and get your feet wet, and then from there you can just take it and, and go with it. And yeah, don't expect to get spoon-fed. No. <laughs> Sometimes. There's a time and a place for that, but I love, uh, I love giving you enough of a challenge that you have to actually go out and, and, and figure out a little bit. I, it's so much better than me just giving you a command and then you doing it and saying, oh, great, that worked. If you actually understand what you're doing and you understand how you can recreate that should you know, five years pass and all of a sudden you need to do it again. Now all of a sudden it's becoming not just a tutorial, but it's becoming knowledge. And that's, that's the exact reason why we've done some of the GIMP tutorials we've done. It's about getting that knowledge so that when you need those kind of tools, all of a sudden you know exactly how to use them. It's so. sort of like they give a man a fish 
No, never mind. Kind of, sort of. Speaking of GIMP, we're going to be looking at uh, how to crop images with the GIMP, uh, a couple of different ways to do that tonight, uh, taking us right down to the basics and just something that, uh, that we're going to be looking at. Uh, also, a program called Gmount ISO, which is going to allow us to mount ISO CD and DVD images on our Linux system uh, using a GUI, so you don't need to learn your mount command. You don't need to know what dash o loop is. Oh my. Wow. Novel idea. So stick around for that. Uh, also, the Eco Alkaline batteries. Your, your microphone is still working off of that nickel metal hydride. We talked last week about, uh, about the test, the highly scientific yes. test that we're doing with this microphone is to let that puppy run until it starts making alien noises. So you in the chat room, it's your responsibility to let us know if it starts making some, some noises because that's our cue to change over to an eco-alkaline battery. What are these? These are... These are eco-alkalines. And you know what percentage of cadmium, lead, mercury? I would guess it's under 10%. It says 0%. 0%. So batteries, as you know, are, are really bad for the environment in that a lot of people, even though on every battery it says do not dispose of, you know, to, to take it to your, your city landfill and, and dispose of it correctly. I know that a lot of people don't do that. They don't do they that. They end up going in the bin. And that's really, really bad for the earth. And there are chemicals that are in there that are, are not just precious metals and things that, that are, uh, I guess, what you would call renewable resources, like things that you can reuse, things that could be reused. Uh, but being that they're just going to be buried in the landfill, they aren't going to be reused. Right. These batteries don't contain any of those chemicals, and they are environmentally friendly. Even landfill friendly, it says. Landfill safe. Landfill safe, okay. Yeah. Well. So we're going to be taking a look at the, these over the next couple of weeks, not just from an environmental standpoint, but also to determine if they are, in fact, good batteries, because that's really what it boils down to. Right. We want to know. So do they last like an alkaline? Do they last like an alkaline? And we are right now comparing it to a nickel metal hydride, so I know it's a bit of apples to oranges, but... Again, it comes well, down to... This is alkaline. It is an alkaline. It is alkaline, yeah. but it's... Right. But the batteries that we use are nickel metal, nickel metal hydride because they're rechargeable. And I do that because I don't want to be filling the landfill with batteries, right? Now, most rechargeables I've used seem... They don't typically hold a charge as long as an alkaline. do very well, like after... Yeah. The so, initial. so it is a bit of apples to oranges, yeah. but, but if these last longer and they're earth-friendly then that's something to think about. And then we're going to also be comparing them with your standard like Energizer batteries as well, okay. just to kind of get an idea uh, where they stand as far as power goes and how long the battery is going to last for. Uh, and you can find out more about the Eco Alkaline. I'd love for you to check them out. Uh, just go to cat5.tv slash eco. That's E-C-O. And you'll be able to find out more about the, uh, about the batteries themselves and what it is that they do with their carbon neutrality and, and more information about that. So check that out. Also tonight, we've got a uh, Brother MFCJ615W. We are giving away uh, very, very soon. We're taking more qualifiers for that. We'll have more information for you. And, uh, yeah. All right. That kind of takes us into the show. We have an email. Welcome, everybody. Hey, Fabulous. should we do some more questions? Or? Uh, we love questions, yeah. Get them in in the chat room. is a great place to, to uh, meet with us. And want to say hi to everyone in the chat room. I know that uh, there are a few people joining us tonight for the first time. Uh, I also uh, see people like uh, Pyros Rock, who have been away from us for quite some time. And it's great to have you back, and uh, very nice to see you, and great to see you in the chat room. Nice to have you here. Jot, I've missed you on Planet Calypso. It's good to see you uh, here in the Category 5 chat room, and it's certainly great to see everybody there. If you're brand new here, let us know. Uh, send a message to our attention, Robbie F. or Eric Kidd, and we'd love to say hello. We would. George Definitely. Brown has a question. Hey, George. Hi, George. I am having problems getting NFS to work on my Unraid server. What is the exact configuration to enter into the mm. drive and user configuration boxes? Thanks in advance for your prompt reply. Very quick. Okay. Figures you'd start with one that I don't generally use, to be honest. George, I, I've, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a lot of people very angry with me right now. Uh oh. I've been just using Samba on my Unraid box. It's worked great. Right out of the box, it's been working fantastic. But I know that um, some people have had trouble getting NFS working on the, um, on the beta version of Unraid 5. So that's the first thing I would check, is if you're using the beta version. I'm on 4.5.6, and everything seems to work just fine. 
but of course beta software is a little bit different. It's not meant to be used in a production environment. I'm going to go to lime-technology slash forum. And you, you know me... You the .com in there, mister. Well, that would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> Lime dash... Well, that's why I zoom in okay. and why I have you here to poke fun at my <laughs> idiocies. And he's writing it down. Lime-technology.com slash forum. And you know me well enough to know that I don't, uh, I don't often just send you somewhere else for an answer because I prefer to give you the answer if I have it full out. Uh, but in this case, because I am pretty much just using Samba on my, NF, uh, on my Unraid box, I'm going to go to the forum and I'm going to type in NFS and just see what comes up. And I think we're going to find that uh, there is a lot of help here in the forums on getting this to go. First one is NFS, and here are some people who are talking about that very uh, issue about the beta version having some problems. There are some, there is some information here about uh, how to actually set it up, and there are links to other forum threads that are going to help you out a lot. So, um, so check out the uh, the forum at lime-technology/slash.com/slash/forum. Uh, what are you writing down? No, nothing. I, ca I can't even read your oh, handwriting. That, that's probably did you good. notice that I wrote everything in all caps tonight? I, I so did that you notice can, that. Yeah, yes. do you like that? It's pretty legible. Yes, it's, it's pretty Fantastic. Good. I'm sorry that I don't have a, a direct quick answer for you there, but uh, I think that with Unraid, I've said it before, they have a fantastic community. Uh, there are people in the community at the forum that are, are I don't know if they, they sit there hit and refresh or what, they're amazing. They're so quick to answer my questions anytime I've had any problems. So I'd encourage you to use that, that forum. Get in there, ask your question. If, if it's not already answered, I would do a quick search, make sure that uh, it hasn't already been covered. And, uh, and if you can't find an answer to your question, your specific problem with NFS, then I would, uh, I would post a thread and, uh, and see if you get an answer. But like I say, if you're using Unraid 5 beta version, uh, I would downgrade to 4.5.6, which is stable and does not have some of the reported issues that NFS uh, encounters with, uh, with the beta version of the software. Uh, that would be the first place I would check. Okay. I hope that points you in a direction that uh, that gets you some help. And for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, with Lime technology and Unraid, uh, that is uh, basically like a do-it-yourself Drobo kind of system. It's a it's a network attached storage server that stores your data redundantly with uh, with parity. So that means if if you've got multiple hard drives in that server in that computer and one of those hard drives crashes, you don't lose the files on that hard drive. You put in a new hard drive, it rebuilds the, uh, the array, and, uh, and you haven't lost any of your data. So it's, it's a fantastic piece of software that you use to build your own uh, kind of oh, network cool. server. Yeah. So that said, I use it with Samba, which means using, and this is why I, I jokingly say that some people will, will be annoyed with me, uh, because that's the Windows protocol for accessing files over a oh. Windows network. NFS is, uh, is basically like the Linux equivalent of that. So um, with Samba working just fine for me, that's all I've, I've used. I use Fuse to mount it with FSTab so that uh, I have mount points on my network that uh, on my Linux machines that I just access my Unraid com uh, computer as if it was a hard drive in my computer. It's pretty fantastic. Well, Check them out, lime-technology.com. Well, there you go. Dot com. Dot com. All right. We have another question here. Great. Um, and this is from Roke Up North. Hello. Okay, after watching a few shows where you talked about the Pogo plug, I went and purchased one. Great. I'm very happy with the device. Yes. The problem I'm having is I can't install the drive onto my Ubuntu 10.10 .10 notebook. I downloaded the TGZ file and that's as far as I went. Could you go through this setup with the terminal program? Also, a short tutorial on how you used it to share photos through email and other useful tips would be helpful. Thanks. Mm. Okay, we're getting into some kind of some kind of technical kind of geeky things there. Wow. So I don't want to lose everybody. So we'll we'll start with uh, with your your second question about you, you about sharing photos. John and me? No. 
<laughs> no, I know if you if you're new to the show or if you if you haven't caught a show, it's kind of like a roller coaster ride here, isn't it? Where it certainly can it, be. It sure can be. <laughs> um, <laughs> where you know sometimes we're talking real geek speak, and sometimes we're talking where you know I try to keep things at the level of the user who's asking the questions. So so there's something for everybody here. And certainly, if you find that we're talking a little a little too geeky for you, you can post in the chat room. Hey. What does this mean, or whatever? And, and Eric has certainly translation, please. Yeah, exactly. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Pogo Plug is another great device that uh, allows you to share files and things like that um, through a network-connected um, Pogo Plug external hard drive. Okay. So uh, you can find out more about it on our website, Category5.tv. We've done some reviews and things. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to. Uh, fancy little website, https colon slash slash my dot pogo plug dot com. So let's bring that up. This is what it looks like. My pogo plug dot com. I like to put the S in there because I like to have a secure connection to my pogo plug at all times. Alright, so once I am at that website, I'm going to log into my Pogo Plug with my Pogo Plug's email address and password. <laughs> we just had a techno babble alert. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, so I have logged in to my Pogo Plug. I'm just going to find somewhere here. I don't know. So on my Pogo Plug, there we are. So I've logged in. I've got my folders. I've got my hard drives over here, all that kind of stuff. So I've got all my folders that I've backed up files to and so on and so forth. So in my case, I've got a backups of my photos and things like that. Um, so I'll just browse those just like you just like you would think to do. Uh, let's see what I can come up with. Here are family pictures from Halloween or something would be a good good one. Here's a good one. Third anniversary show of category five. So I've browsed to this folder. These files are on my Pogo Plug because I backed them up there through the Linux uh, connector that, that you're going to be setting up just after, after the news this evening. Um, or, alternatively, you can actually upload to your Pogo Plug using the Upload Files button. And that's going to allow you to browse your hard drive and, and upload files from anywhere. Good name for that button. It is very self-explanatory. With the Pogo Plug, you'll see that I can uh, change the way that it looks. Just like you would do with uh, with your computer, you can look at uh, thumbnails and things like that. So if I click on a photo, Pogo Plug automatically generates a preview of that photo. This is where it was great, John, to to use the Pogo Plug to share with you your wedding photos, because it automatically generates all the the uh, thumbnails and things like that. Automatically um, sizes them down and makes them super fast. So now, as I browse through. I'm able to see all the photos that came out. Poor Robbie having to take self shots. <laughs> Everybody else gets someone to take a photo of them. What can you do? What can you do? So these photos here are in a folder on my Pogo Plug. And if I want to share them, so this is how I shared the, uh, the photos with John and Christy. I'm going to click on the Share This button. Mm -hmm. And all I have to do here is turn on sharing for this folder, Category 5, Third Anniversary. Turn on sharing for this folder, invite people, and I'm going to enter anyone's email there. So I'm going to go live at category5.tv. I can include a personalized message. So I'm going to say, hey, here are the file, the photos, I should say, from the third 34. anniversary show. Okay. So now, over here, I'm going to hit invite. Thank you for correcting me. And you'll see that this has now been invited to live at category5.tv, and that user has viewing and download rights. I can also set it so that they have full access so that this particular user is then able to actually upload photos. The reason I'd want to do that, I do that often with uh, clients. 
when I need to transfer files back and forth with clients that are too big for email, I'll just give them access to a Pogo Plug share, create a folder with their name on it, share it, give them full access, and they can drag and drop files into that, uh, into that share. It works fantastically. So I don't need to do anything else there. That's all I have to do. It's done. I don't have to save or anything. I just close that and I'm good to go. Uh, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up my email and we're going to see what happens here. I'll log out of my Pogo Plug because I want to be, uh, I want to be right out as kind of like an end user, okay? And let's see what happens when I get into my email. And this will be what the end user is going to see when they connect into the Pogo Plug. So here, I've got an email that says, a new Pogo Plug share from Robbie Ferguson. Robbie Ferguson has shared the folder 2010-09-21, Category 5, third anniversary, with you. Copy the link to your browser, powered by Pogo Plug. All right. And then I'm going to hit that link and see what happens. This is what the end user sees. So this is what your friends and family see when they get it. So here we go. Pogo Plug, congratulations. You've successfully received content from a Pogo Plug owner, etc., etc. It gives you the option to sign up if you like or close this window. If I close the window, you'll see that I've got full access to this folder in a read-only mode. So I can click on any of these pictures, and boom, there it is. If I like that photo, which I don't particularly, but anyways, I can download the photo in its full resolution. What I'm seeing in, in the Pogo Plug view is like the shrunk down thumbnail versions. If I'd like, I can download the full version. Quite big enough. It's going to give you the, f the file that is your source file. Right? So you don't have to worry about creating these uh, galleries or anything like that. It does all that automatically. So that's, uh, that's all there is to it, really. It's got the playback feature. If somebody wants to push play, they can, they can view it in a slideshow type mode. They can blow it, blow it up to the full size of the, uh, the browser window, for example. And all that stuff is all included in the Poco Plug. That's all you have to do in order to share that. I'll, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to share this link with you. Uh, so that you can actually take a look if you are watching the show right now. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just kind of throw together a quick link here. Oh, well, there you go. Pogo plug. So if you go now to cat5.tv slash pogo plug, and anyone who goes there right now is actually going to see that share, and you'll actually be able to experience my pogo plug firsthand. You'll be able to see how that works. Uh, how that interacts with you as the end user. So this is the person who you're now sharing your photos with or your videos with uh, through your Pogo Plug device. Pogo Plug is fantastic. You can get it uh, from pogoplug.com. Do please make sure you tell them that uh, that you heard of them through us. Uh, we're not uh, sponsored by them or anything, but it is a product that I really uh, that I really endorse and, and love having the product. It's fantastic. Um, so I do encourage. Wish you I had one. Well, I encourage viewers to check them out and if. It's something that you like. Tell them that you found it here because then they know that uh, that it, that them coming on the show and, and things like that. We've done a couple of interviews that it's been effective for them uh, to take the time and be a part of Category Five. So uh, yeah, check that out. And uh, we're going to come back to the first part of that message in a little bit um, about actually setting it up so that Linux can connect into that drive. Okay. In the meantime, it is uh, it is time to jump into the news, Hillary. If you are just about set. Would you like a mint first, Hillary? Uh, oh, I'm good. You're good? I'm golden. I am ready for this news. Dun, da, da, da. Again, I need my own theme song, but there here you, I here am. Here you go. <laughs> From the Category 5 TV newsroom. When we mentioned Ubuntu's inevitable shift from the X window system to Wayland recently, the chat room was abuzz with users scared for the future of their desktop, wondering what alternatives they could switch to in order to hold on to their familiar X system. Well, it seems Canonical is not on the wrong track at all with the announcement, as Fedora's Adam Jackson would also announce Fedora Linux will inevitably be heading the same direction, saying that's a, that the switch from Wayland will be a serious win for a lot of things, calling the downsides pretty negligible. Tom Woolwerda from osnews.com sums up a lot. He says, a very happy Fedora is looking to eventually move to Wayland as well. Since it is about time, the Linux world looks and moves beyond X to something that has been designed from the ground up to be modern instead of something that consists of layer upon layer upon layer. 
Get ready to hear a lot about Wayland as two of the big players work towards this pivotal change in the desktop Linux landscape. While the change may not come as suddenly to Fedora as it will to Ubuntu, you can expect Wayland to begin appearing in the repositories as soon as Fedora 15. At an event in San Francisco yesterday, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, who was shown here, apparently singing opera, announced a social networking site, new modern messaging service complete with Facebook.com email addresses. We don't think a modern messaging service is going to be email, Zuckerberg said. Instead, his company's new service will seamlessly integrate various means of communicating. It's true, people are going to give Facebook.com and they're going to have email addresses, but it's not email, he said. Facebook's new messaging service includes three components. Seamless messaging across all the ways people communicate, conversation history, and a social inbox for filtering exactly the messages you want to see. Zuckerberg says their new service is not an email killer, but rather a messaging service that has email as a part of it. Facebook is rolling out the new service over the next few months, and the first users will need to be invited to use it. Microsoft has updated the Windows Service Pack Blocker Toolkit to include service, uh, service Pack 1 for Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 R2. Users who don't want SP1 will be able to simply disable automatic updates. Many businesses, however, prefer to keep automatic updates turned on, but block the server pack itself so they can first test to make sure it works with all their software. The Service Pack Blocker will allow them to continue having Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 R2 update automatically without SP1. The tool is valid for 12 months following uh, general availability of the Service Pack. After that, Microsoft will push uh, out SP1 to everyone with AU on regardless of whether it has been blocked. While the release candidate of SP1 is out now, we can expect the final release in or around January of next year. You can grab the tool by following the link at category5.tv slash newsroom. And Microsoft said the Windows-based supercomputer has broken the petaflop speed barrier, but the achievement is not being recognized by the group that tracks the world's fastest supercomputers because the same machine was able to achieve higher speed using Linux. While at first glance, some may think a 5% performance difference between Linux and Windows is not that big a deal, you have to remember we're talking about a petaflop here. The difference is actually quite staggering. The petaflop barrier was first broken in two, uh, June of 2008 when IBM and Los Alamos um, achieved a long sought goal in the super com uh, computing industry by building a Linux-based machine that could perform 1,000 trillion calculations per second, a remarkable speed known as a petaflop. So 5% in our case is equivalent to 5 trillion calculations per second more on Linux than Windows using the same hardware. The newest top 500 ranking came out on Sunday, and Microsoft still hasn't placed the petaflop machine on the prestigious list. Only five of the top 500 computers were using Windows, while for, um, for 459 used Linux. Um, Microsoft officials would surely love to improve upon that number, but realize they are unlikely to ever catch Linux in this ranking. The 2011 BMW 550i may not drive itself, but it does have some features that are definitely in that direction. The new 550i from German vehicle manufacturer BMW sports not only a sleek design, a 400 horsepower BMW twin turbo V8 engine, but also a few sci-fi S features as well like a functional laser-guided cruise control system, which will accelerate and slow down the vehicle depending on traffic conditions. Unlike the traditional cruise control, which will happily plow you into stop-and-go traffic at 100 kilometers per hour. But the coolest feature by far, according to the Montreal Gazette contributor Miranda Lightstone, is Park Assistant. YouTube videos and reality TV have, caught, uh, have taught us that so many people have trouble with parallel parking. So why not let the BMW do this for you? By selecting the Park Assistant program on the car's iDrive system, the car will automatically identify a parking spot for you that will fit the vehicle. Then, by putting the car in reverse and taking your hands off the wheel, the car will automatically steer you perfectly into the tightest of parking spots while you apply your makeup or watch Category 5 TV on your Android device. The BMW 550i carries an MSRP of over $73,000. But when your friends comment about how well you park, this will be our little secret. Get the full story at category5.tv slash newsroom. 
The Category 5.TV Newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from Gadget Works Guru, Becca Ferguson, and our community of viewers. If you think you've got a news story that's worthy of on-air mention, send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv. From the Category 5.tv Newsroom, I'm Hilary Rumpel. Category 5 TV is brought to you in part by Planet Calypso. This massive multiplayer online game is available as a free download from cat5.tv slash Calypso. Now, once you've got it downloaded and installed on your Windows computer, make sure you say hi. And there's something for everyone here on Planet Calypso, from hunting to mining, crafting, and just plain socializing and having fun with your friends. You can download it for free at cat5.tv slash Calypso. If you're a Linux user like myself, of course, this makes it worth the dual boot. Cat5.tv slash Calypso. I'll see you on Planet Calypso. This is Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 165, and you'll find us online at www.category5.tv. We'd love to have you there. We'd love to have you joining us in the chat room. Nice to see so many uh, friendly faces in the chat room tonight. And lots to cover tonight. Lots. Lots and lots and lots. I should make a quick note that Hillary is not using her HD uh, eyeball webcam tonight. She's actually using an integrated webcam with the, uh, with the laptop. So we'll just make a quick note of that. So what do you got going on? Well, hey. Um, somebody wondered what Brecky was. Hillary was at a bed and breakfast. But oh, okay. Brecky, which rhymes with Trekky, is just another way of saying breakfast. So there Brilliant. you go. Um, Gadget Wisdom Guru has a question. Sure. All right. Dear hey, Robbie F., for the longest Dear time... Dear Guru. <laughs> for the longest time. What is the longest time? It's about as long as it's taking you to read this okay. question. I have been troubleshooting <laughs> some odd errors in my hard drives that came to a head when I tried to add yet another drive to the system. After a lot of head scratching, I finally came up with a theory and opted to replace the 430 watt power supply to a 650 watt, and the problems went away. Apparently, I have failed to account for my power needs. How can I adequately calculate how much power I need? Okay, first of all, head scratching on a hard drive is a bad idea. Oh, this kind of head. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. I'm going to tell you about a little tool that's, uh, that's pretty neat. I created this thing because when I first built an Unraid box, I, decide, I, I said, like, there's no calculator out there to tell me how much space I'm going to get, what my power consumption needs are going to be, and things like that. So I created unraid.category5.tv. And this is a calculator for Unraid. But what it does, let's say I've got a couple of hard drives in there, right? And then I calculate, it's actually going to tell me the power consumption as well as the data storage. But it tells me the load on startup and the operating load as well as idle, okay? So what you can do, Guru, is you can use this tool to calculate your, um, your load, which is basically 30 watts per hard drive, right? Um, that's really what you need to know. On average, it's going to be about 30 watts for, for a hard drive as, as it runs. Um, and then the other numbers are based on each drive's specific parameters. Your drives themselves, if you look up uh, the manufacturer's website, the actual drive will have its own specs, but it's you know, on average going to be about 30 watts. Um, so you look at, if you've got two drives, you're automatically using 60 watts at startup, plus you've got an optical drive, plus you've got the, the motherboard, and if you've got a quad-core processor or anything that, that is going to take a little bit of juice to get it going. Uh, and, uh, and also not just the amount of watts to the power supply, but the quality of the power supply makes a difference too because um, even with uh, a, a lot of watts as far as the, the wattage rating on a power supply, it might be a 650 watt power supply, but it has um, a, a, a long startup time. So uh, that's something to take into account as well. With a, with a better power supply, the thing will what it will do is it'll, because it, the power supply won't come on right away. I'm trying to verbalize something that I don't know how quite to verbalize, but um, what, what a good power supply will do is it will not actually turn on your computer until the power supply has reached a full charge and can give full power. So something like a thermal take tough power, for example, what it does is it generates the power first and then pushes it out to the computer once it's charged. Uh, with a cheaper power supply, what happens is 
it generates the power and pushes it out to the computer at the same time. So as it's gaining power during that first boot up cycle of the power supply, the computer's draining, draining from the power at the same time. So as it's turning on, there's a lull in the power and then it gets up to speed. And so that can cause hardware damage and it can cause problems with, uh, with your peripherals. So uh, a better power supply will wait and then fire it up. It's a couple milliseconds, but so you won't know it uh, like to, like visually you won't necessarily know. but. Uh, but yeah, about uh, 30 watts for a hard drive. Look at your different peripherals within the computer. Find out how many watts each peripheral is going to use. You've got fans within that computer. You've got a cooling system. Uh, each one of those is going to be rated at a specific wattage. You don't need to get too particular, but you've got to know that if you've got multiple hard drives, you're going to need more than a stock 450 watt power supply, which basically a 450 is, is rated for like your home like your home office or small office business use where you've got one optical drive, one hard drive and a basic uh motherboard with no uh AGP PCI Express uh video card which is going to draw extra power and you may even have to upgrade the power supply if you've got PCI cards that are drawing more power but essentially if you've got an uh, a better video card than what's on board then you're probably going to need to go higher than that as well so I hope that helps Guru or again at least pushes you in the right direction does that uh, <laughs> anything else to add to that or that's that was uh, pretty much it okay um, thanks for the question Guru and he was really hoping we got to it because he really didn't want to have to type that out again <laughs> <laughs> copy and paste it's fantastic okay we have established a society on planet Calypso. Wow. So if you are going to be joining the planet Calypso universe, Entropia universe, uh, make sure you do a search at one of the society terminals for Category 5 TV viewers, or just Category 5, and uh, make sure you uh, apply for membership of the uh, Category 5 TV viewers society. What we're going to be doing is we, as a group of, um, of viewers and myself, we're going to actually go on a couple of runs together and uh, I'm going to help you to learn how to use the game effectively uh, and how to have a good time with and meet with other friends and, and uh, have a good time on the This is all so. aimed towards planet domination? Pretty much, yeah. We're going to take over the world. Well, Calypso. No, we're going to have a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, but that is the Category 5 TV Viewers Society. And I'd love to have you as a part of that. It's going to be a lot of fun. So there we go. Speaking of viewers. And cross that off my list. <laughs> Speaking yeah. of viewers, we have some new viewers. Great. Yes, indeed. We hey, have everybody. Brown, 3285, all the way from Colorado. Hey there. Um, Susan Lancy. Hey, Susan. China. Hey. And Joe Pierce, 1988, from the U.S. of hey, A. Joe. And uh, Val Pannon from Sweden. Val Pannon, nice to have you here. I could take another run at that if you didn't like that. No, I looked and that, that looks right, yeah. Okay. And we have... I just didn't want to say it and say it wrong, that's all. <laughs> you sure? We argue about such little things. I, I was going to go on about this one here, but I don't think we should, right? Um, the chat and, room is already covered better. And Sunshine2311 from Vietnam is with us. I'm not, nice to have you here. Yeah, so there. So some new viewers. Yeah, great to see you. If you'd like to uh, be a part of our community, all you have to do is just sign up at our website, category5.tv. And I'd encourage you to do so before December 1st, because on December 1st, we are going into new registration lockdown for 30 days. Oh. We will not be accepting any new registrations on the website, but here's the kicker. Anybody who registers before that time is going to get a bonus of Category 5 viewer points. And those points can be redeemed towards ballots for prizes. They can be redeemed towards product, downloads, uh, all different kinds of things. So you want to make sure that you get registered before December 1st. And uh, that way, when we go into lockdown, you are going to receive those bonus points. And of course, that applies to anyone who is already registered as well. Even if you registered three years ago, you're eligible and you're going to get those extra points as well. Um, that's going to automatically happen when we convert our database over for the uh, new website, which launches, launches on January 1st. Very excited about that. Uh, also, we've got that brother MFC uh, J615W printer that we'd love to give away. Uh, do check out the details on our website, category5.tv. Click on Interact, and you'll see the, uh, the link at the very bottom of that menu. 
Again, that's Category5.tv, your chance to win uh, a, an all-in-one printer from Brother Canada. Very cool. Yeah, so let's uh, let's take a quick look at G-Mount ISO. This is a fantastic little tool that, uh, that I stumbled upon just uh, in my quest to find something cool to share with you. And this is basically a, you, you've heard of an ISO, you know what an ISO image is. You mm -hmm. download, when you downloaded Ubuntu, for example, uh, you most likely downloaded it as an ISO. And that is an image of, uh, not a photo, but an image of a CD. It's like an exact duplicate of the CD itself. The nice thing about a, an ISO is that it, it in every essence is the CD, but it's on a file on your, on your hard drive or on a, if you've got an Unraid server or a Pogo plug, you can have it stored on there if you like. And it's nice to be able to, on Linux, you can mount that with very little effort as if it's an actual CD on your computer. What I did tonight, just, just to have an ISO, is I actually just, I just grabbed uh, a movie that I had on my, on my shelf here sideways, and I just copied it as an ISO, ripped it to the hard drive as a DVD ISO. So it is a copy of that DVD in an ISO format. Not for transmission, but just for my own personal backup storage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this tool, which you can bring up your terminal. We're going to do this through terminal. I've gone into Applications, Accessories, Terminal. We're going to do it this way just so that you can get familiar with how easy it is to use the terminal. sudo apt-get install gmount iso is the name of the program, just like it sounds. gmount iso, all one word. There's the command, sudo, it makes you a super user. apt-get is a tool that allows you to install things off the internet without having to use a disk or anything like that. Install is what we're going to do, and the program we're going to install is gmount iso. As soon as, I, as soon as I hit enter on that, it's going to ask me for my password, and here we go. It downloads it off the internet for me, automatically sets it up, and it's done back at the prompt. I can close out of that window. Now, mounting a, a CD or a DVD in Linux is reasonably simple anyways with the mount command in the terminal. People who know how to do that, it's, it's a breeze. But there are, you know, of course, there, there are times when you don't want to use the terminal. You want to use a GUI application, and that's where this comes in handy. So I'm going to bring up that tool now. It's going to be found under System Tools, Gmount-ISO. Very, very simple tool, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go back into terminal and I'm going to create what's called a mount point. This is where we're going to, from now on, I only have to do this once, I'm going to go into my slash media folder by typing cd slash media with a space between. reason I'm going to do it in terminal is because I need to be super user to do this. sudo make dir and I'm going to call this, uh, you know, I could call this fake dvd. I'm just using that as the word that, you know, as what I'm going to call it, because it's going to be my fake DVD drive. It's not a real DVD drive, but for all intents and purposes, the computer is going to see it as if it was a DVD drive as soon as I mount a DVD on there. So now, in my Gmount ISO application, I'm going to choose my mount point, which is going to become slash media slash fake DVD just like we put it in, okay? reason I want it to be in slash media and the reason that I had to do sudo in order to do that is because now as soon as I mount a DVD ISO or a CD ISO on that mount point, it's going to automatically put it on my desktop. So now I'm going to open my image file, which is on my desktop, and it's called sideways.iso. Okay? So that's all I've had to do, and then I click on mount. It's going to ask me for my password, which I enter, and boom, it's done, and you'll see that on my desktop there is now a fake DVD icon because I've essentially as far as the computer's concerned, I've inserted that disk. I've mounted it. It's there. What's your question? Oh, no, that wasn't... Oh, you're just hounding me. I was just hounding you, my friend. Okay. Carry on. He does things like this. Moi? So now, if I bring up that, that disk, if it, was a, if it was anything other than a video disk, of course, here it is. It's, it's seeing the folder structure of the video itself, um, and I could play that if I like. Also, um, if it was a data disk, I would have access to all the data. So this is a way to keep backups of your data disks. If you've purchased software and you, uh, you know, if you're worried that you might lose the CDs, or even if you don't want to, or break one, yeah, you might want to drop it on a cement floor or something along those lines. Keeping the ISOs is a great way to uh, to have a backup because you can always burn it if you accidentally break or scratch that disk at beyond repair. Uh, but also, it's a way to use that that uh, disk without actually physically having to search for the disk and insert it because 
you got to admit, after several years, you end up with a pretty big stack of disks all piled together and uh, not always easy to find what, you, what you're looking for. Um, so that's a pretty cool tool. That is called Gmount ISO and it's available free in Linux and you can download that using apt-get or your favorite uh, repository. You can use uh, yum if you're using an RPM based distribution. Uh, you can use your repository manager like Synaptic Package Manager. You'll find it in there. Gmount ISO. And I hope you like that tool. Somebody wanted to know why you had to make a folder in media. The reason that we made a folder in media is that that's called a mount point in Linux. Um, so yes, it's a folder from our, our, you know, from the perspective of what we're actually doing. We're creating a directory, we're creating a folder. But by mounting a CD onto that folder, Linux now says, okay, this is, this is a mount point for the CD. So the hardware or the, the ISO is now accessible through this mount point. So now slash media slash fake DVD, when mounted, becomes an actual DVD drive as far as my computer is concerned. So I can do the regular stuff. I can install the software from that DVD. I can, I can uh, watch the movie from that DVD. I can do whatever I want to do with that, with that virtual drive. And it's I probably think. faster than a DVD. Absolutely. You're running it off your hard drive. Yeah. Another thing to think about is if you're going traveling or whatever, your, your DVD-ROM drive to watch movies or whatever is going to be spinning and using up your battery very, very quickly. Now, could you just make that in any folder? Yeah, it could be any folder. So you could make a folder on your the reason I desktop? Put it, or? Absolutely. But then okay. it's there always, regardless of whether it's mounted or I hope not. I that answered your question. Uh, Here, well, here's the thing. I put, it, I put it in slash media slash fake DVD because then when it's mounted, it shows up on my desktop. Oh, okay. If I unmount it, okay, watch what happens. I'm going to unmount this. I'm going to zoom out just so you can see. There's my fake DVD, okay? I'm going to unmount. Where'd it go? Wow. The folder's still there, but the mount point has nothing uh, associated with it, so it disappears from my desktop. If I created the mount point or the folder, which I'm going to mount to, on my desktop, that folder then becomes a folder rather than disappearing. So then I might accidentally drag something into it, and then when I try to mount something on it, it won't mount anymore because it's no longer a mount point, it's a folder. Okay. But yes, if you folded it, folded it, <laughs> put it somewhere else, it wouldn't show up in your desktop. Well, the, the nice when thing about it being in slash media is it will show up on your desktop when there's something mounted okay. on it. When, and when you unmount something from it, it will disappear from your desktop. Okay. But it still remains in slash media. All right. Very cool. G give it a try and, and play around with it, and, and you'll, you'll get familiar with the functionality and see how that works. Uh, in addition, tonight I would like to look at uh, a World War I memorial panorama that one of our viewers sent in. Gadwill was working on this this week. And uh, after having watched Category 5, got into Hugen and, uh, and started playing around with creating their own panorama. That, that was the night we had some video card trouble. It's quite possible, and I actually tried uh, recreating that same panorama, and I did it successfully tonight with Hugan. Okay. And there what it is. What a great program. Fantastic program. You see how my photos get all completely weird edges here? Because the photos themselves are taken, you know, I'm holding the camera in my hand, I'm not using a tripod. So what I can do in order to touch up this photo now is I can do what, uh, and here's Gadwill's panorama, which looks fantastic, Gadwill. This is an excellent uh, early attempt. And with this memorial, you can see that there are edges on the photos. See the, these white areas, these curvatures and things like that? This is like the rectilinear distortion caused by the photos being placed on the image, and we can crop those out. I'm going to use mine as the example because it's so obvious that there are distortions caused by the positioning of the images with my photo here. And so we don't want to send it to uh, our friends and family like that. It's not, it's not really a usable photo that way. Um, but what we want to do is we want to grab this marquee tool. There's a few different ways we can do this. Quick and nitty gritty ways. We're going to grab that square marquee. We're going to grab the left corner, left topmost corner, and drag to the bottom right. And see what I'm doing there? Is I'm putting this marquee line so that it never goes outside of the photograph itself. So I'm going to adjust that in the GIMP. I can drag it up and down. And I can adjust where that's actually going to fall. So unfortunately, see, I'm going to lose a little bit of the top of 
my subject, which is the spirit catcher at the waterfront of Barrie. So I'm actually going to lose this area of the photo because the only reason I'm going to lose that is because I'm having to pull it down on this side. I'm going to go up to the top of this tree and now you'll see that I've got a lot more space up here. So nowhere is my image now, is my marquee going outside of the photo and my subject is still in the photo. It looks good. I can pull this up a little bit because I really don't need so much driveway. And now I'm going to right click and go image, crop to selection, and now my photo looks like that. So now it's something that I can be proud to send to somebody. Now the other option, what I was talking to Gadwill about last night was, when you've got that marquee, if you don't want to mess around with your master image, because this is my master image, I can copy that marquee go copy or copy visible. This is only a one layer so I can go copy and now right click on the image and go edit paste as new image. Unlike Photoshop where you've got to create a new image with file new image and or know the hotkeys this is actually going to paste that image into a perfect image that is scaled to the actual marquee that I created 3878 by 1264 so as you can see it's very high resolution if I were to zoom in on this photo, you can see that my panorama has turned out very, very well and that uh, I have no odd anomalies around the edge of the photo. So that's just a real quick nitty gritty, kind of here's a quick way to crop with your photo. And we don't have a lot of time tonight and that worked out fantastically because it is a fairly uh, straightforward tutorial as far as using the GIMP uh, to crop an image. Uh, but that edit and then uh, edit copy or edit copy merged if you want to copy all layers of your image mm -hmm. and then edit paste as new image is a very very helpful tool and it automatically picks the size absolutely it, it creates the canvas to be the size of the photo and uh, and places whatever is in your clipboard into that area so it's it's very very good I think we've covered everything did you touch on auto crop well, auto crop is really auto crop is a different thing yeah. altogether, and that's a fantastic no, it's, it's tool. A great You're tool. absolutely right. Great tool. If you've got a logo that's on a white background, for example, and it's got white all around it, and a lot of it, you choose auto crop on the image menu of GIMP, and it will suck in the sides yeah. and crop so within the a image. Few pixels, it's beautiful. It's fantastic for working with stuff like that. With a photograph, it's not really applicable, but with a logo or something that you want to get the edges in nice and clean, and you've got a solid background color. Uh, that is a fantastic tool. Um, that image, that's, yeah. a, that's a great picture you took, by the way. And, Thank you. And that's the Spirit Catcher uh, yeah. down by Campenfeld Bay in Barrie. Right. And we have a new viewer who just, it's his first time here, Noel. Hey, Noel. And he's from Barrie. Oh, so well, look at that. So how apropos that you do the Spirit Catcher. Well, it, uh, a tribute to Noel tonight is, <laughs> is our wonderful panorama of the Spirit Catcher created with Hugan and then cropped with the GIMP. Both free tools available on Linux. Uh, All right. <coughs> fabulous. Well, this has been a fun show. It certainly has. Everything. It's great to see everybody in are the we out of, We're out of time. We're out of time. I know. It, it flies by. Oh we are out of time already. Gang. How did that happen? It's been a lot of fun. Hillary, did you have fun tonight? Sitting there so quietly. Um, as always, I love Category 5. It's my favorite day of the week. It's Tuesday. Hello. Hello. You heard her, people. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Like, let's give some attitude. No, 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 no beans today? No beans. Well... We had a scotch mints. Want a mint, Hillary? Guys, I would like a scotch mint. I'll, I'll, and if I had one, it would be cool beans. Ha! <laughs> said it. Trying to give you one through the webcam here, Hillary. It's not working. Hey! You just Thanks put that back in. I put it back in the... It's my bowl. That's your candy now. Fabulous. <laughs> Hillary, have a fantastic week. Thank I'm not going to complain. I'm have a great week. It's been nice having you here. This is Category 5 TV. You can catch us online. Category 5.tv is our website. and We'd love to see you there throughout the week. And I hope you have a fantastic week. John, nice to have you here. Night, nice everybody. Nice to be here. Have a great night. We'll see you next Tuesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. See ya. Bye.